good afternoon students uh, again i am starting with glaucoma we had uh, almost completed primary open angle and secondary open angle glaucoma uh, uh, i started with lens induced glaucomas and this is what we had discussed last time what are lens induced glaucomas and how do we manage it uh, in lens induced glaucomas the most important topic which is must know for you all is uh, uh, phacomorphic and phacolytic glaucoma these is these topics are expected as a five marker question the other lens induced glaucomas which you should be definitely knowing is one steroid induced glaucoma which i will be taking in detail again and second is neovascular glaucoma so let's start with neovascular glaucoma so neovascular glaucoma is a condition which is very difficult to treat why because it is considered to be a intractable glaucoma which leads which uh, occurs because of formation of neovascular membrane in the anterior chamber now what is this neovascular glaucoma if you see the etiology that has been given here most of the etiology that has been given here are all the reasons are all the diseases of the posterior segment or what we call as the diseases of the retina so if you see the causes for neovascular glaucoma basically are diabetic retinopathy central retinal vein occlusions sickle cell disease eis disease central retinal artery occlusions now all these conditions lead to what we call as hypoxia of the retina now once there is hypoxia of the retina the retina being a highly perfused structure tries to retain its oxygen supply by releasing special substances these substances are called as vascular endothelial growth factor so they kind of promote the formation of blood vessels on the retina the purpose of this uh, formation of blood vessels in the retina is to maintain the oxygen supply of the retina but these vegf act on all the structures present in the eye namely they act at the angle of the eye they act on the iris and they also act on the retina so what you get as a result of these vegf factors or vascular endothelial growth factor is you get new blood vessels at all levels in the eyeball now these new blood vessels though they help to maintain the oxygen supply of the retina they actually compromise the blood supply they actually cause lot of bleeding in the eye now why does this happen is because these blood vessels are extremely fragile though they increase the blood supply in all the structures they are extremely fragile and because of this property they tend to bleed very often so if you look at this iris can you see this prominent blood vessels which i can see here these prominent blood vessels actually can cause more damage than helping the anterior segment of the eye now similar blood vessels also exist at the angle now what these do, do these blood vessels do is they try to mechanically block the angle and they lead to what we call as a open angle stage of glaucoma so these blood vessels completely block the angle structures namely the trabecular meshwork namely the uh, schwalbe's canal the schlem's canal all over these new blood vessels tend to mechanically block the angle offering a resistance for aqueous outflow leading to what we call as a open angle stage of glaucoma now as these blood vessels progress along with the new blood vessels there is also a lot of fibrous tissue which proliferates in the angle and this fibrous tissue has a tendency to contract and when they do so they lead to a secondary angle closure stage because these fibrous structure contract and they mechanically close the angle leading to formation of the angle closure stage of glaucoma now what is the treatment now this neovascular glaucoma is said to be the most refractory glaucoma because it's very difficult to treat no matter how many blood uh, drops or medical therapy is given the angle is mechanically blocked so the pressures do not respond to your medical management even the surgical surgical management fails here 
you are unable to do lasers because there are a lot of blood vessels in the angle and so the visibility of the trabecular meshwork becomes compromised so you are not able to perform laser also when you do a trabeculectomy surgery these blood vessels tend to regrow across the ostium leading to reblockage of the ostium and hence even the normal line of management of trabeculectomy fails so the main line of treatment when you are discussing neovascular glaucoma is till you take care of the new blood vessels there is no point of going ahead with the treatment of glaucoma so how do you treat the retina here you do a procedure which is called as pan retinal photocoagulation this is kind of burning the retina so that the requirement of oxygen becomes less so kind of converting the hypoxic retina into a an anoxic retina so the retina uh, only those areas which are functional are spared so that the blood supply is enough to maintain the functional part of the retina not requiring much oxygen so there is less secretion of vascular endothelial growth factors and since there is less secretion of vascular endothelial growth factors eventually the vascular endothelial growth factors start dropping down and there is no longer stimulus for the new blood vessels to grow and eventually all the new blood vessels tend to regress so the first line is take care of the retina do an adequate laser so that the stimulus for release of vascular endothelial growth factor is reduced once the stimulus is reduced you go ahead and treat the glaucoma with a trabeculoplasty more often with an augmented procedure what we call as trabeculoplasty with antimitotic agents or trabeculoplasty with a shunt okay i will be showing you the pictures of shunt at a later stage when we are discussing the surgical part however just remember it's a refractory type of glaucoma the treatment is not complete without treating the retina you have to do a retinal photocoagulation at the same time treat the glaucoma and do a therapeutic procedure of trabeculoplasty probably with a shunt to have a better result okay coming to steroid induced glaucoma now steroid is a very common drug which is used for various problems not only in the ocular but various parts of your body so any patient who is put on steroids in any form be it topical steroid be it inhalational steroid be it uh oral steroids all these people who are using steroids for a long term basis have to be evaluated time and again for two major diseases in the eye one glaucoma and two cataract so any patient who is put on steroids of course we put on steroids only for life threatening conditions such as copds or asthmas autoimmune diseases so these patients cannot be withdrawn on steroids more often so we need to keep a watch that they don't develop the side effects of steroids so why why do these patients develop glaucoma the the hypothesis which is put forward says that the steroid alters the metalloproteinases and the mucopolysaccharides which are present at the intercellular space in the trabecular meshwork and since there is deposition of these metalloproteinases or mucopolysaccharides the trabecular meshwork gets compromised and hence the aqueous outflow gets compromised and hence the patient ends up with a transient glaucoma if not taken care of these can be actually vision threatening so there are people not all of them develop so we classify them as steroid responders or high responders who have a rise in iop after 6 weeks or most of them are moderate responders and most of them don't respond at all so the only thing that we need to do is keep a watch on the intraocular pressure and if the patient develops an increase in iop the best regimen is to shift the patient into a steroid sparing immunosuppressant if possible if not then we continue the patient on intraocular uh, anti glaucoma drugs if we are able to stop the steroids the intraocular drugs for glaucoma might be stipulated for 4 to 10 weeks by close monitoring and once the pressures come down to normal we can shift back or stop the anti glaucoma medications however if the patients need to be continued if the patients need to be continued we might have problem with the uh, we might have to go ahead and do a surgical intervention 
Now this is a rare form of glaucoma. Why I am including here because it was asked in UG papers few years back. So it's a very different mechanism that glaucoma exists here. It's called as malignant glaucoma, not because it's an outcome of malignancy. Most of the people mistook as malignant glaucoma means a glaucoma related to the malignancy in the eye, but it is not so. The word malignant here actually infers that this glaucoma is refractory to treatment. No matter how aggressively we treat, it does not respond. So what is this? It's a rare type of glaucoma. Generally, you will see the patient coming after some surgical intervention in the eye. It can be a laser procedure such as an iridectomy. It can be a posterior capsulotomy or it can be an intraocular surgery such as cataract or trabeculoplasty. So any patient who has undergone a, a, a surgery in the recent past will give you a history of surgery in the recent past and you will see a very high IOP and extremely prodromal symptoms like headache, vomiting, something like it mimics an angle closure attack. So what do you see? When you look at the patient, you have an extremely high intraocular pressure and you have an extremely shallow anterior chamber. So looking at the picture here, you straight away treat, try to treat it as an angle closure type of glaucoma because the angles are shallow and the IOPs are very high. But they don't respond to your angle closure treatment management. They might transiently respond to your uh, drugs such as hyperosmotic drugs like uh, astrazolamide or mannitol. However, the iridotomy that you do as a treatment of anterior chamber, uh, narrow anterior chamber fails. What actually happens here is the entire ciliary process which uh, secretes the aqueous humor rotates backwards into the vitreous cavity and since it rotates backwards into the vitreous cavity it secretes lot of aqueous into the vitreous cavity leading to expansion of the vitreous gel and a forward shifting of the entire lens and iris system. So apparently when you look at the patient from front you have an anterior chamber which is extremely shallow but you have the vitreous which is expanding because of absorption of the extress aqueous. So how do we treat this? One of the drugs which is actually contraindicated in angle closure that is atropine helps. Though it looks like an angle closure, atropine is the one which kind of uh, is a strong cycloplegic drug. So because of the strong cycloplegic action that it held, it has, it sometimes re-rotates the ciliary ring and brings back the ciliary processes into the posterior chamber. So not every time but it might help to some extent by paralyzing the ciliary body and bringing back the anatomical uh, position of the ciliary body into normalcy. However, you need to also continue astrazolamide and IV mannitol because these are the drugs which are going to reduce the IOP drastically. Meanwhile, if it is not uh, helping you, you have something called as a irido uh, hyalotomy procedure wherein we make a through and through uh, uh, opening from the iris to the zonules to the anterior hyaloid. So we have the aqueous which was collecting in the posterior space or in the vitreous cavity coming into the anterior chamber through this uh, aperture. Okay? And if that also fails, fails, we can do what is called as posterior sclerotomy. Now this uh, I brought into your notice because this was asked but though it's a rare kind of uh, uh, glaucoma that we get come across, the only telltale clue that we have is a history of surgery in the recent past. Okay, They will have some ocular intervention which have, they have undergone in the recent past which helps us in the diagnosis of malignant glaucoma. Okay. Now coming to the treatment modalities, you have iridectomy as a treatment which I have already discussed in angle closure glaucoma. This iridectomy can be performed with the help of lasers. The lasers which are used are ND, YAG and Argon laser. Uh, you can do a surgical iridectomy also but with the lasers it is much more easier and does not require an inpatient stay of the patient so it becomes an OPD procedure and hence laser iridotomy is more preferred compared to a surgical iridectomy. Coming to filtration procedures, these are the surgeries what we I was telling till now as trabeculectomy. As the name suggests, trabeculum we know it's a part of the angle. Ectomy means to remove a part of the angle so as to facilitate the aqueous outflow. Now there are various types of trabeculectomy. You have something called as free filtering operation where we make a full thickness opening. And so we get a complete connection 
between the uh, subconjunctival space and the anterior chamber you have a guarded filtering surgery where you have a partial thickness fistula you have a scleral flap which will cover the fistula and nowadays you have something called as non penetrating surgery now why do we uh, why are we advancing so much towards a non penetrating surgery is because a trabeculectomy has a very high risk of end of thalmitis that is infections inside the anterior uh, inside the ocular cavity because there is a direct opening of the intraocular uh, structures into the outside space so these uh, this kind of a surgery makes the patient more prone for intraocular infection and hence the newer surgeries which are called as non penetrating surgery though they are not so good in controlling the pressures they are more safe because of the risk of infection being lesser now this is a picture of an iridectomy can you see a defect in the iris here now this is done with the help of a laser so this gives us a connection between the posterior chamber and the anterior chamber and hence facilitates the reduction uh, of the pressure in a angle closure type of glaucoma trabeculectomy can be done in most of the types of glaucoma uh, you can use it for primary angle closure primary open angle for congenital developmental all secondary glaucomas it helps mechanism is you are making a new connection between the anterior chamber through the uh, trabecular ostium into the subconjunctival space now we have we will be showing you surgical videos because we have a dedicated class where we will be showing you surgical videos on cataract trabeculectomy and all but here i will just briefly tell you how this surgery is done so basically uh, we uh, we have uh, first what we do is we do a dissection of the conjunctiva and we raise a flap of conjunctiva so if this is the eyeball and this is the iris this is the conjunctiva which is dissected and a flap is raised once a flap is raised we do a triangular partial thickness opening in the sclera by a dissection and we raise the flap once we raise this flap what we get to see is we see the trabecular area at the limbal junction we make a horizontal ostium a full thickness opening here so that there is a direct connection below this flap into the anterior chamber at the same side we also do a peripheral iridectomy so that whenever the acrus comes from the anterior chamber comes through the ostium percolates from three these three spaces and collects under under the conjunctival bleb the iris does not obstruct it so we do an iridectomy we raise a conjunctival flap we make a partial thickness dissection in the sclera we end block remove the trabecular meshwork and once there is an end block removal of a trabecular meshwork you have a continuous connection between the anterior chamber and the subconjunctival space the triangular flap is reposited and secured with three sutures now these can be a fixed suturing or you can also have uh, adjustable suturing depending on the intraocular pressure that you record post operative you can either tighten the suture so that you maintain the anterior chamber or you can loosen it if you are seeing that the aqueous outflow is reduced so we can do that kind of suturing once it is done we reposit the conjunctiva back making a bleb and that is the area where the collection of the aqueous takes place after doing a trabeculectomy surgery so that is called as a bleb and from that space the aqueous will percolate into the episcleral vessels and enter the systemic circulation now this same surgery trabeculectomy can be made as guarded by what we do as instead of making a end block or removing the entire chunk of trabecular meshwork you can just shave off the sclera till you get a very thin film of sclera which will remain which will avoid the entry of organism into the anterior chamber so it is called as a non penetrating surgery because you are not making a direct connection between the bleb and the anterior chamber okay i hope you can clearly see what i am trying to depict here so deep sclerectomy is a procedure where we don't cut the trabecular meshwork we just shave off the sclera so there is a thin membrane which helps in percolation and hence there is a controlled drainage of the aqueous 
and so there is also less chances of organism entering into the anterior chamber reducing the risk of end of thalmitis in the post operative a similar guarded surgery a uh, non penetrating surgery is visco canaliculostomy where we use heavy viscous agents or super viscous agent of uh, sodium hyaluronate which is injected into the schlem's canal it kind of expands and since it expands it ruptures the inner surface of the schlem's canal into the anterior chamber the inner surface of the schlem's canal is nothing but the juxta canalicular meshwork and hence it helps in reducing the intraocular pressure i have also uh, put pictures of the bleb now the same surgery which we did here in the bleb can be accentuated by using antimitotic agents what i mean by antimitotic agents is once you have removed the the chunk of trabeculum you can put antimitotic agents so that they prevent fibrosis and hence they prolong the shelf life of your surgery they prolong the time through which the surgery can be effective at the same time if you are anticipating that this time of this kind of a glaucoma can be more refractory to your treatment such as neovascular after doing the trabeculectomy surgery you can introduce a shunt which will not allow the ostium to close or the the gap that you have made to close uh, the the conjunctival flap which is replaced is also sutured tightly back into the limbus by a conjunct uh, by a continuous suturing so this is what i meant what i surgically try to depict is you have the cornea here and you have a nice bleb now this bleb is nothing but conjunctiva and you have the triangular thing below that on the sclera so the aqueous excess aqueous is draining here and from there it is coming on to the episcleral veins and from the episcleral veins it is going into the systemic circulation so this is a picture of a patient who is post trabeculectomy with a well formed bleb a nicely formed bleb okay this is what i meant by non penetrating surgeries or uh, as i said deep sclerectomy or visco canaliculostomy where you do a partial scleral flap artificial drainage procedure as i said the same surgical steps but you will introduce a shunt and this shunt uh, kind of prevents the closure of the ostium so these are the shunts which are introduced this is kept into the subconjunctival pocket as depicted here and the tube is introduced into the anterior chamber and so it will be draining from the anterior chamber into the episcleral space is that clear now you have something called as cyclodestructive procedures what are this cyclodestructive procedures cyclo means ciliary body destructive means you kind of ablate the ciliary body so that there is no longer secretion of aqueous so this can be done in a permanently blind eye when we do it through what we call as cryotherapy or you can have selective destruction of the ciliary body through either ndr laser or transclerical diode laser okay so here we use a retinal probe 3 mm from the limbus in cyclocryotherapy which freezes at 80 degrees and 180 degrees of globe is destroyed and and hence uh, the seal the production of aqueous humor will be reduced so this is what i said approximately this is the landmark surface landmark for the ciliary body 6 mm from the limbus you apply the uh, probe here and you selectively destroy first 180 degrees and then 180 degrees you freeze the cells and once you freeze the cells they are no longer functional and so the aqueous humor secretion reduces however cyclocryo is only preferred in a permanent in a eye which has no visual rehabilitation but when i am talking about ndr or diode laser we are applying this transcleral uh selectively so that we have only selective destruction of ciliary body and the rest of the ciliary body functions because if there is no aqueous humor you can't expect the survival of the intraocular structure because nutrition is provided by them so cyclocryo is preferred for a completely blind eye whereas transcleral or endocytophotocoagulation when you have some visual potential okay so this can be done externally as a transcleral procedure or endocytro where you go into the eye and selectively ablate the ciliary body so these are the surgical surgeries that are available for uh, glaucoma so when i ask when you get a question on management of glaucoma please mention medical management laser management and surgical management in surgical management mention about iridectomies trabeculectomies non penetrating surgeries 
and cyclodestructive surgeries so classify it like that and please put one or two points in favor of each okay so today we finish the class of glaucoma next class i will be discussing about lid anatomy and lid malpositions okay thank you